Hello everyone, I'm Lieutenant John McGrath of the Needham Police Department. I'm pleased to present to you this Needham Channel's production of the department's first Citizens Academy. From October 13th to November 17th, 2021, the Needham Police Department hosted a six-week program to help residents understand how local law enforcement works and the available resources and services. This six-episode series will provide people who are not able to attend the program with an opportunity to watch the demonstrations that covered topics including the organizational structure, criminal law and procedure, use of force, community resources, and regional collaboration. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the first episode, The Structure of the Needham Police Department. In this episode, Chief John Schlitler will introduce the various positions in the Needham Police Department and their responsibilities. You'll also learn about the standard training the Needham Police must acquire and policy improvements the department recently implemented. So our staffing is we have one chief, uh, deputy chief, three lieutenants. We have seven sergeants. Um, we have an administrative sergeant, uh, five patrol sergeants, and a detective sergeant. We have 24 patrol officers. They're the officers that you'll see in the crews that uh, we run three shifts, 24-7, 365. Um, one thing to note about our patrol officers and our patrol sergeants, we work a rotating schedule, um, and that means they work four on and two off. So it rotates. They get one full weekend off every six weeks. Um, so it's, it's a difficult schedule. Um, we have one prosecutor who works with the district attorney's office in the Dedham District Court. Um, prosecuting people, bring over the paperwork for people who have been arrested or committed crimes. Three detectives, we have a community service officer. One of the main functions of our community service officer is working with our crossing guards. We have roughly 20 to 22 crossing guards and we cover 62 crossings a day for our needles and St. Joseph's as well. School, two school resource officers, one at the high school and the other school resource officer works between the elementary and middle schools. We have administrative patrol officer who does a lot of our training um, and records keeping in regards to our training. We have one motorcycle officer, one traffic officer. Uh, we just, in the last two to three years, our community outreach officer who works with our embedded clinician at the police department. And they do a lot of contacts and follow-ups of people that are suffering from mental health, um, domestic violence, substance abuse, and other issues. They need follow-up. And that's a plain closed, uh, you know, position, so that takes away some of the stigma that the officers go there to follow up. And we work with the families to make sure we can get them the resources that they need to help them with the issues that they're struggling with. Then we have five civilian dispatchers. They work at, um, you know, in dispatch where all our calls come in, the 911s come in. Um, we have uh, five civilian employees. This is our functional chart. So um, basically what happens is it's broken down. Um, this is our, like our organizational chart. So we have a deputy chief and the three lieutenants that oversee one section of the department. Um, the deputy chief is community service, Professional Development. Matt Forbes, Lieutenant Forbes, is Investigative Services, Professional Standards. Uh, Lieutenant Belinda Carroll, um, she's Traffic and Community Safety. And then Lieutenant John McGrath, Patrol Operations and Emergency Management. So if you look at all the functions, that's what they oversee. So all those, you know, things are under their control. And there obviously there are sergeants and patrol officers that are down there that they oversee that take up some of those responsibilities, but as you can see, there's a lot going on there. So we talked about the sergeants, the seven total. I know it sounds, you know, when, when you look at the numbers, it seems like a lot, but we have like a straight days, eight to four, but then we have a sergeant that'll work two midnight shifts, which is midnight to eight, and then two four to midnights. And then we have officers, uh, sergeants that work two four to midnights and two days. So basically, if you have a day shift four, his two days off, there's a sergeant that works two days and two four to midnight, so they cover. So they plan a direct shift operations, um, you know, law enforcement, um, 
protection of property and life, uh, apprehend those suspected violation of the law. Basically, what the patrol sergeant is, is he's a supervisor on the street. So he'll oversee what the police officers are on the street. They'll respond to calls. And they oversee, make sure that the paperwork's done. They make sure that when officers are dealing with people that are in violation of a criminal law, that they have all the elements that they have the probable cause to make arrests or to charge. So they basically, they're, they're really one of the main cogs in our police department. Um, they're the first line, the front line supervisors. So they, they respond to incidents. They're the first ones on scene at the supervisory level. Um, so their role is extremely important for what we do. This is our uniform patrol division. It's the largest division, which we talked about, 24 hours, 365. Um, and they are the ones that are out there um, in the street doing whatever the radio calls comes in. But they also, they're the backups for our crossing guards. They're the ones that respond to accidents. They do selective enforcement, which is traffic enforcement for speeding, um, at high crash locations they'll do enforcement. If we see a trend where there's a certain area that has a lot of crashes, we'll up our uh, enforcement in that area. So they basically, they're out in the road. They're the ones that you're going to see. They're in the marked patrol unit. Detective Bureau, um, there's three detectives and one detective sergeant. Um, they're basically under the general supervision of myself uh, and the lieutenant detective. They're a general um, detective unit. We do narcotics, sexual assaults, um, and any major criminal activity that comes in town. So we've got bank robberies, uh, B&Es, stuff like that. Um, so they do general detective duties. We're part of a, uh, it's called NORPAC. Um, it's a Norfolk County anti-crime police. So it's 15 towns within Norfolk County that we share resources and we work in um, large sale, scale uh, operations in terms of narcotics distribution. Um, and then, you know, we've, the, the presentation you'll see uh, later on is the U-30 bandit. Um, and that was, we had a series of bank robberies. Um, and there was Walpole, Wellesley, Needham, Dedham, uh, where they left explosive devices at the scene. Um, so we used, we brought them in with the FBI uh, bank robbery task force and we worked with them and it was, it was a pretty uh, incredible investigation in terms of s size and scope and, and uh, the analysis of data on this that was able to, to, to help us solve this. Our Dell prosecutor we talked about, our juvenile officer is a patrol officer. Uh, they investigate uh, and process all crimes involving persons up to the age of 18. Um, and basically she works with the schools and, and she works with juvenile crime and she works with the juvenile court. It's very rare that a juvenile is arrested. Um, it would have to be, um, you know, a crime of violence most likely um, is really uh, the last time I believe that a juvenile was arrested. So what we try and do is work with the parents or work with the schools. The schools have a lot more um, authority and, and bite in discipline than the court would have because the court's just, just going to dismiss it. Um, so we work with the schools and we work with the parents to come up with some type of solution that uh, might be beneficial for all involved because the last thing we want to do is introduce a, a, a juvenile into the court system when they really don't have to be. Um, and that's been something we've been doing for a long time, um, and, and it, it's worked well for us. Community service safety officer, this is the one I was, was talking about. The, um, we have 18 traffic supervisors, the 62 crossings daily. Um, that number fluctuates because of, it's very hard to get people that want to go to the traffic crossings. They only work like an hour in the morning, an hour and a half, and then an hour and a half in the afternoon. And to be quite honest, they take a lot of heat from some of the parents at the schools, so it's a thankless job. I, it's, it's tough, um, but they do an unbelievable job, and they, they cover a lot of ground as well. This is our motorcycle officer. Uh, he does a lot of community engagement as well, um, but one of his main roles is traffic enforcement. So him and the other uh, traffic officer, they look at where we're having issues in town or where complaints are coming in. Um, and they do a lot of traffic enforcement um, in, the, in the high impact areas. Our school resource officers, so 
we always had one school resource officer at the high school. And when I took over, I, you know, I spoke with uh, Dr. Gutekunst, the superintendent of the schools, about, you know, I really wanted to add a second one because I, I understood how important it is for, for us to establish positive relationships and communication with, with our, our kids in school. Um, and so, because that builds a trusting relationship, and as they get older, um, they're going to know that, you know, they've had these positive in interactions with our officers and that um, they can look at officers and say, hey, listen, they're here to help me. Uh, they're normal people. They have a job to do. But as we'll see in some of the pictures that you'll see later that they take on a, 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 a ton of different roles. They, they teach classes. They, they do, you know, cooking classes and so forth. So they're really involved in what, what the, the normal day-to-day -day operations at the school. Um, now, this is Rocket. He's the most famous cop that's ever been here in Needham. I was really skeptical at first about getting a, a resource dog. Um, and, you know, I live in Walpole, and they had the first resource dog. They have uh, GoFi, it's called, that they raise these dogs and they train them. Um, so I had that exposure to Rebel, um, who's over in Walpole. And when we had that accident, the, the final... The final thing for me that really solidified how important this, this um, community service dog would be the day when we had the, the two high school girls that were killed in the crosswalk on Webster Street. Um, the SRO Tom Hart from Walpole called and said, hey, listen, um, I want to bring some of the community service dogs over to the high school. Um, I said, sure, that'd be great. Spoke with the, the high school principal. And the impact that that made and the release of pressure and the kids responding to that, was, it was unbelievable. It changed, you know, it, it changed the atmosphere in, that, in the high school that day from just so sad and everybody was, I mean, obviously they still say they were very sad, as we all were. Um, but it let the, the tension out and they were able to play with the dog and they were able to relax for a little bit. And um, I, I just, it's amazing. Um, what this dog can do. Uh, for example, um, just about a week ago, I was out going f to a meeting and I came upon um, a high school student who was sitting on the ground in the middle of the day with a head down leaning against a traffic light. Um, and there was a couple people standing around trying to get information. She would not talk. She kept her head down. Um, knowing that she was a high school student, um, I called the SRO. She had left school. Um, we tried to converse with her, and she didn't want to talk. The SRO came down with one of the counselors, brought Rocket. Rocket walked over, stuck his snout in between her arms and on her legs, and she picked her head up, and that started the conversation. That relaxed her, and she started touching the dog and patting the dog, and the dog kept moving and um, got really close and put some pressure on her so that she felt that she had this comfort um, for her. And that, from that, probably five to 10 minutes later, we were able to get her up and get her to uh, the hospital with the school counselor to get some help that she needed. But Rocket was that icebreaker that came in there. Because we could have said, hey, you've got to go to the hospital. We could have sat there for a half an hour, 45 minutes. But Rocket coming in there, breaking the ice, and just almost being a companion really changed uh, the outcome of that event. And it was, it, was, it was great to see. And they have, you know, they're trained to do, for see people having seizures, that they'll put their, their, their head underneath, the dog will put his nose and head underneath the, the person having a seizure's head so that they don't get hurt. Or if they're having, you know, a panic attack, they'll go put pressure and kind of lie on top of them. And it just it calms them down. It's, it's, been, it's been unbelievable. If you told me this 15 years ago, this is where we'd be going, I'd say no way. But it's the best thing we ever did, I'll tell you that. Mental health, um, I, I think we all know how much this has exploded in the past probably five to 10 years and, and what an issue it is um, in terms of you know, trying to deal with it, getting people the services they need. Um, and we have really committed to making sure that we can do everything um, possible to make sure that we're trained um, and have the availability of the resources that are needed to deal with these in, in, in a way that is beneficial to the party but also keeps us safe. 
Um, there's 24 Needham offices that are certified in cr uh, crisis intervention. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna continue to train that, um, but we're only allowed two spots a year. So when those spots become available, we put two officers in, um, and then you know if there's extra space, we'll put them in, but it's a huge part. All of our officers uh, and dispatchers are trained in, men in mental health first aid. Like I said, we have that embedded clinician, clinician and that community outreach officer, which is really one of the first community outreach officers that I'm aware of in the surrounding towns. And then we have, um, in 2020, we um, partnered with the Dedham Police Department to get a law enforcement uh, clinician through Riverside. So this is a party who's split 20 hours here and 20 hours in Dedham. She can actually respond with officers to uh, if there's a person in crisis. Um, once the scene's safe, then she'll come in and work with officers. There's usually, I'd say 95% of the time, someone that's uh, crisis CIT training, crisis intervention training, and they'll work with that person and family on scene to get them to a place um, if they need to get a bed. She has the ability to get a bed right from her laptop through um, Riverside. We can't do that. Um, you take them to the hospital, it takes forever that, for them to do it. But she can do that on scene. Even if she's back at the station, we can say, this is what we have, this is where the doctors are, this is the resources that they've used in the past. She can get a location uh, based on her level of training. So um, it, it's been, I wanna say, you know, I just updated this the other day, but since January, I think, between our clinician and community outreach officer, we've had 70 to 75 contacts with those two alone with people. And that means following up with family. Because um, a lot of times the people that are in crisis don't want to talk to us. But we slowly work our way in to talk to them. And while doing so, we're talking with their family um, to make sure that everybody's safe and we get them where they need to go. So this has really been a great benefit. Uh, we had a call to Dover PD, a man had a gun, was going to harm himself. We worked with Dover PD, who kept the individual on the phone. The sergeant responded, met with officers, developed a play, uh, a plan of action. Um, prior to rushing and enforcing a dangerous situ situation, the community outreach officer, who was familiar with the individual, he responded to the uh, assist the officer in the scene. Um, so he was able to make contact with the party inside that had said he had a gun, he was going to harm himself. He was able to talk to him. It took a little bit, but he was able to talk to him and have him come out to us and, you know, get, we ended up grabbing him, getting him into an ambulance and getting him to um, the, the hospital where he needed to be to get treatment. But back in the day, we probably would have just gone in the house and kind of see what was going on and kind of develop a plan for there. But that, that hasn't happened in a long time, and this is such an unbelievable approach to doing this, and it, it keeps them safe, and it keeps us safe. So training, um, we do a, a, a ton to, um, to, to train our officers. We've been fortunate enough to, um, my, like I said, my ass, so I apologize, I'm gonna stand your way, but um, we do a lot of training. Um, fortunate enough to have the resources to do so. Um, we do a lot of, um, training on use of force, decision making. Um, and the main thing is we're training our officers to de-escalate. And we have every, we've been doing this for a long period of time. Massachusetts has been doing de-escalation for a long period of time. Um, so we have, we have exceeded what's required by the state and the Municipal Police Training Committee um, who oversees mandatory training um, and requirements in the state. Um, we, this year, in the past year, we've had cultural diversity, implicit bias training for all Needham police officers, uh, mandatory de-escalation training, crisis intervention training, policies, changes to uh, include prohibiting force that uh, compromises an uh, individual's ability to breathe, um, policy changes requiring officers to immediately report in writing any excessive force used by a fellow officer. That comes out of the police reform. Um, that was passed last year. We have um, electronic control device, a taser, um, which is, it's a less lethal option, um, so that we don't, because when we escalate 
enforce or we de-escalate. So you, you go from hands-on or verbal commands, hands-on all the way up to your firearm. And in between is a baton or your taser or a bolo wrap. A bolo wrap is um, a device which probably people don't know too much about it, but a bolo wrap is a device if you're dealing with somebody that's in crisis or may have a weapon or something of that nature. It's a less lethal device and it shoots out two prongs with um, a Kevlar wire around it and what it does is it, it we shoot it around your legs so it incapacitates you just for a minute so that you can't move and then officers can come in and de-escalate it without having to use a higher level of force. It's in every cruiser that's on the road okay. so the officers have that um, as an option. We also have, um, we, we just implementing beanbag guns, it's a, non -less, it's a less lethal option as well. Because um, the last thing anybody wants to do is use lethal force. And um, so we're trying to do everything we can to equip our officers to have as many options as possible. We created the community outreach officer. Milo training, which you guys are going to be able to do. So what will happen is you have a real life scenario where somebody will come out of a bank. And you don't know if they have a gun. And, you know, so you're trying to de-escalate the situation. But the person who's running it can, can kind of change the scenario based on you, you know, if you're using verbal de-escalation and bringing that party down, then the party can de-escalate. But if you're, if you're not engaging, then they can escalate. And it, a lot of, it's, it's, it's difficult because things happen so fast. And when you're in this, it's real life, you know. Um, and it's as close as the real thing as you can. Um, and I think you'll, you'll like it because you'll understand some of the issues that we have when things are moving so fast, right? And you get tunnel vision and you kind of see, you don't know what's going on around you, but it's a real interactive uh, training that um, it, it's, re it's really been beneficial so far. Uh, we did f fair and impartial training uh, this year, uh, just last month. Um, so all officers complete de-escalation mental health techniques for first responders. Um, so de-escalation, like I said, is used in, in every use of force training. So we do firearms. You know, we might draw a weapon on the range and, you know, we might say de-escalate to taser. So the officer had to put his, you know, firearm away and then revert to a lower standard. Or it might work their way up where you are standing there talking to somebody and they say gun. And then you go to that. So, um, and part of the escalation is we, we want our officers to use tactics, verbal communication, Slowing down the pace of the incident is, is huge, instead of rushing in. Unless, obviously, there's an active assault on and the person's in danger. Uh, warnings, we'll wait out a person. We've done it. We've waited 30, 35 minutes, an hour, to get them to come out. There's no need, like we said with that Dover call, there's no need for us to go in there. There was nobody in there. There was nobody in danger but himself. Um, and we felt the best case is talking to that person, to try and have them come out on their own and end it peacefully. Uh, creating distance and cover, and then calling in additional resources. That might be other officers, that might be the, the embedded clinician uh, that, we, that we deal with, uh, our community outreach officer that really has a good handle on the people in town that, um, uh, that do need help and has established a, a rapport with a lot of these people and their families. So when that person shows up on scene, that person feels relaxed because they've met that person. They understand that they're there to help them. They're there what, you know, they know that they're trying to get them to the right place. These are some of the goals and priorities that we're working with. Um, and this is all on our website. Uh, we've posted all this stuff. So um, work with stakeholders to sponsor a series of conversations between the public and police officers. Um, meet regular stakeholders and groups of communities of color to build mutual trust and respect. Implement all local components of this new state police reform law. Um, We've done the Junior Police Academy now for three or four years, so rising seventh and eighth graders, we, we do a week-long class that's free to um, the people that attend during the summer, right the week after school gets out. We're obviously looking to leave civil service, which is a long explanation, but civil service is uh, the hiring authority pretty much in terms of a state test. They give us a list. It's pretty rigid and structured that we don't have a lot of uh, flexibility with with hiring um, so it's something that we're looking exploring to try and get out of so that we can hold our own test um, and you know just recently we the civil service test when I got on 
there had to be 100 and something, 150 names of Needham residents that were on it. This year, only 12 people from Needham took the test. So that, you, that shows you where the idea of law enforcement is going in town, um, not just town, but nationally. Um, I, I was at a conference uh, the other day with the chiefs from Massachusetts. In the last year, 103 police chiefs in Massachusetts have retired. So it's kind of a trend that we're trying to, to stop and, and get qualified people in here, but it's a, it, it's a process. These are some of the things we do, uh, coffee with a cop. So we go up to the senior center and meet with the seniors and we're up there a lot. Um, my community service officer's up there a lot and we sit down and just talk with them. Um, and we do it four or five times a year. Tug of War, Needham vs. Wellesley, Relay, Relay for Life fundraiser. These are road races, school field trips to the police station, crafts with a cop. Um, so we have our community service officer who with COVID class for our seniors uh, via Zoom so and then the seniors dinner um, that's my daughter that's there she's in high school in Walpole um, and then we do the Halloween neighborhood parade the powder puff game which is coached by our officers um, and sponsored by the police department and Roach Brothers who um, donates the shirts and stuff Roach Brothers is awesome to this community and the amount that they do for the community and the police department and everybody is it, it's unbelievable. Um, and that's fine, that's a rocket. This is the guy. Um, so we do self-defense classes. We do simulating impairment to our high school kids so that they understand um, as they're getting ready to take their, their driver's test or their learner's permit that they have a general understanding. They put on the goggles and it's, it's like you've been drinking and they can't walk and they can't, they can't function properly. Their motor skills are gone. So. It's really pretty cool. and um, This is our SRO Anderson. She's now a detective, but um, she was teaching cooking classes at the high school. And this is one of our officers keeping a child occupied while parents are speaking with the clinicians. Um, so we put on this mask that the child wanted them to, and they hung out and talked while the parents worked things out for the child. Um, the station tour. and. Um, that's part of our Junior Police Academy. We did a tour of the Norfolk County Sheriff's Office. And, you know, that's really, that's it in partnership with our community. It's a, it's a big thing. I'm, I'm a real true believer in it. Um, I've been chief for five years, a little bit over five years, and um, I'm grateful. I am grateful for having the officers that I do and the amount of time and um, care that they put into what they do. We're not perfect. Um, if we make mistakes and... We try and own them and make, make sure that we don't do it again, but um, we, we, we have a, a real stake in our community and we want to be part of the solution uh, and not part of the problem. Thank you for watching the Citizens Academy. Next episode, we'll dive into the criminal law and procedure. Stay tuned.